at AIA Australia. We're making healthy living easier by incentivising your clients with rewards. Like discounts on their gym memberships, eligible flights and insurance premiums with AIA Vitality. It's no wonder that we've reduced client lapse rates by 50% and helped grow client engagement. To find out more, contact your AIA CDM today. how are you all today? Thank you for tuning in to XY Live. This is my first time um, leading the interview today for a very, very, very cool subject, uh, which is powering women in advice. Um, while we wait for everyone to join, I might uh, welcome everyone on board. Phil, everyone knows Phil. Phil is our, our, our XY Live gun. Um, and of course, we have the guest of honour, a woman that needs no introduction, but I'll give her one anyway. I'll do my best. Uh, Deborah Kent, uh, previous AFA president, now AFA treasurer, uh, money management's woman of the year last year, uh, owner of Integra um, Financial Planning Practice for um, now 21 years and all round amazing human being. Uh, we're gonna talk to her today in, um, in all of those capacities, but uh, one in particular uh, as the founder of Inspire um, off the back of International Women's Day last week. So everyone give Deb a warm welcome. How are you going, Deb? I'm good, looking forward to it. Good. Um, I'd like to thank, before we get started, I'll thank AIA. Thank you so much to AIA. Uh, it's because of AIA we can come to you every week. Uh, they help power XY Live, um, really cool peeps at AIA. Also like to thank um, our two event partners uh, for our next Sydney event, Beyond the SOA. We're hoping to see you all there. That's uh, Midwinter <laughs> and uh, Centuria. Um, so if you haven't registered for Beyond the SOA yet, uh, We've just put the link in the chat box. It's going to be a really cool event where we're going to explore all the value adds that you can provide your clients aside from just um, providing them with an SOA. We've got Mia Taylor from Evalesco coming along. We've got Clayton Daniels and we've got Mark Nagel from uh, Traster all coming to talk about the cool things they're doing in their space. So it's going to be really, really good. Um, yep, yeah, that you can see in the chat the links there. So. Um, you can click through. Okay, shall we get started? Let's like go. Ah, Ray's in there. Hi, Ray. <laughs> okay, so last week uh, on March 8th, so on Wednesday was International Women's Day, uh, which is really cool um, initiative there's, uh, around, around the world. So that's a global event. AFA Inspire did a national um, event in each state and in New South Wales, uh, we put on a panel discussion um, with a broad range of people. We had some politicians. We had Kerry Chikorovsky from um, a, the previous head of the Liberal Party. We had um, Vanessa Patterson. We had Brad Fox. We had Jonathan Hoyle, uh, CEO of Stanford Brown. We had Julia Newbold from the Stellar Network, Philippa Sheehan from My Planner. Um, and we, we had a really good discussion about women in advice and how we can power women in advice and how we can increase the number of women in advice, um, both giving and receiving advice. Um, and it was a really, really cool discussion. So um, we thought it'd be a great idea today to have a chat to Deb because Deb actually founded Inspire, um, uh, aside from her many other accolades. So what I'll do first is, um, Deb, maybe you can fill us in on a bit of your background and, and how that led you to inspire uh, to found, founding Inspire. Yeah, cool. Um, so I um, am a school dropout, um, ran away from school at a very young age. And when I ran out of school, I said I would never look back. And that's been my mantra all my life. And uh, coming from the wrong side of track, sometimes that's good to get you going. And uh, so that was cool. And I married, I've got two children, grown up children, one living in London and one here with two very gorgeous uh, grandsons. And uh, I got into advice um, many years ago, actually, in 1988. And I worked for a, a then bank and I became one of the first female financial advisors, one of two around Australia, which was very interesting, only two. Um, and then later on, I, I ventured out and started my own business. And uh, that business has been going now for 21 years and has had some, uh, I've had some some near fails in my life, um, pretty, pretty serious ones, 
going through a uh, major court case and coming out the other end and rescuing my business and building it to back to where it is. Um, and my passion has always been around women because women have always come up to me and said, how did you do it? How did you raise a family? How did you start a business? How do you do all this stuff with your industry work? And it kind of inspired me then to, to look at Inspire. AFA has been a great uh, launching pad for that. So we launched it in 2013 and um, we had a number of really cool women around the country who helped us craft it to what it is and it's just a fabulous success for not only women in advice but also from an AFA point of view. Awesome, awesome, yep, no, and I can vouch for that um, being um, really involved in Inspire uh, and uh, becoming involved in it through coming to one of the Inspire events and going, wow, this is awesome, there's, there's a place for me and there are people here that are really doing everything they can to make sure uh, that women are included in financial services. So, um, so I, because of that, I, I actually, that's what drew me to you straight away. I thought this is a woman that's doing something, this is cool. The, the entire space um, was in very, I would say, inclusive, um, which is kind of uh, what we're going for, I think, when it comes to gender equality. So uh, kudos to Inspire for that. Uh, maybe, uh, Deb, I could ask you, why do you think the industry needed Inspire? Do you think this is, uh, did you come to founding it out of a desperate need? Was there a hole? Was there a place where you thought, right, no one's doing this, so I'm going to do it? Look, I think it really stems from the fact that, um, you know, the advice network is growing. You know, we're growing as a profession and I think the future looks really bright for us. But we still have a very low content of women advisors. And, you know, whilst we have some fabulous male advisors out there, Phil, you're one of them, the up and coming and, you know, groovy advisors we've got out there. But And we've got some great men, but we don't have a lot of women. It's about a 20% level of women and we need to increase that. Um, women do make um, really good advisors. It allows them to have a career where maybe they can juggle things like family um, in, the, in their business because of flexibility if they get into advice. But it seems to be that a lot of women just haven't had the confidence to go that extra level. We have great women sitting in the background, para planners, doing some fabulous stuff in the background, but getting them to step up has been the hard bit. So Inspire was really, uh, I just guess, generated out of our Female Excellence in Advice Award that we found that more women were, well, not a lot of women were actually jumping into our Advisor of the Year Award. So Female Excellence gave them a platform to jump into. And uh, off the back of that, we decided to do Inspire. And it was a, a passion of mine. So I was happy to chair it and get it going. And the idea is to not just have a networking group because there's heaps of, of women's networking groups, right? You can go and have a champagne with, you know, umpteen dozen women and meet them. But this was more about how do we actually get you to feel different about yourself, feel confident enough to take that next role, step up to that next level. And so Inspire is about, yes, connecting women, but also educating women, giving them um, tools that they can, uh, I guess, use to help give them the confidence. You know, simple things like public speaking or doing things like this. So it's, and that's just why I think Aspire is, is absolutely such a great women's group in our, in our network at the moment, because it does do more than just connect. It's about encouraging, empowering, and doing all those things for women. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Now, you mentioned um, in, in that answer, Deb, uh, things like family, juggling family, having confidence, um, having to step up a bit. Do you, um, do you think you could perhaps maybe enlighten us with a couple of roadblocks or bold choices or tough um, things that you came across in your journey uh, to, to, to being a business owner or where you are today as a, um, AFA treasurer or um, uh, or in your role as AFA president as a woman um, that you think perhaps um, Inspire help, you, you said Inspire helps with, with all those things. What what are some of those things that women are facing today that we could really, um, as an industry, help uh, to make better? So say with, say for example, with um, with family, are we, are we not flexible enough with working hours yet? What, what kind of things can we do? What initiatives can we put in place uh, to help with those tough, um, decisions or 
Sure. So, so some of the some of the tough things that that I had going through um, my career journey was we never had anything like Inspire. We just mm. didn't have. So we didn't have women there to help encourage us. You know, you'd walk into a room, I'd be one of two or three in a, in a sea of grey suits. Um, and, you know, that's another reason why I think Inspire works so well. So some of the things that I encountered was, obviously family does come up a lot. Um, I've been very lucky to have a very supportive husband that basically lets me live my dreams and just sits back yeah. and goes, yeah, that's okay, cool, go for it. Um, and I think having a support network around you is really good. Um, you know, going from being a part-time employee as a mother and making a decision to go full-time was, was a big thing for me. How was I going to look after the children? Um, and look, I, I was probably a little bit lucky because back in those days, we didn't have really childcare centres, but we had a lot of support from each other. So we would, you know, look after each other's children. So it's a little bit different back in the, you know, in the days of the 80s when I had my children. But now, of course, we've got childcare, which can help women, but it's expensive. So mm. there's things that need to be done there about how can we get women back into the workforce um, and, and make it easier for them. Um, other roadblocks that I came across was just merely being a woman, a blonde woman in an industry where um, I had to prove myself um, rather than, oh, did she get the job for a particular reason? And I wonder what that might be. Um, I don't really like that stuff existed back in those days. And I think because we are having these conversations now and we are growing, that, that times are changing, that we are getting better at recognising women in high level positions and encouraging them, but there's still a lot to do. Um, getting women back into the workforce, you know, childcare. How can we encourage the government to make it deductible, for instance? How many women do you know that do the numbers and go, well, it's not worth me working? Um, mm. Flexible hours. I believe flexible hours should be for everyone, men and women. We have that here in Integra because we believe that males also should have flexible hours to be part of the, the bringing up of the children. Um, you know, there's always roadblocks, I guess, that hit women's confidence, you know, can I, can I do this job? You know, a, a guy will go in and look at a job and go, yep, yeah, I can do that, even though they may not be able to do all of it, but they have that inbuilt confidence that says, you know what, I'll just do it anyway and I'll learn along the way. Where women tend to say, I can do that bit, I can do that bit, but maybe I can't do that bit, so no, I'll sit back. Um, we need to encourage women more to take um, chances get them to take a challenge, do the leap of faith. Um, personally, I've always been like that because of who I am, that you know, if I want to do something, I'll do it. And hey, if it's a challenge, let me learn it and figure it out. Um, you know, get, getting the role as the AFA president, um, that was a challenging role. And there's stuff that I had to learn along the way. And we make mistakes, but we should praise ourselves when we do well and learn by our mis mistakes. But um, yeah, so roadblocks are always going to be around you know, family, women feeling guilty going back to work. And we need to be able to, to help them get through that. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you, Deb, was um, for those that weren't at uh, the event last week, uh, our outgoing CEO, Brad Fox, um, made a comment which really stuck out to me, which was, uh, we often uh, talk about asking women to stand up and to step up and to have the courage to um, sort of smash the glass ceiling and break into these um, higher roles or break into um, to more senior positions. Uh, but what we should be doing is making sure that the people at the top are actually making room for them to be there and that that, that can often be the biggest problem that women are trying. But it's a bit of a, a closed tight door or a boys club up the top and women can't break through. Do you think um, that that is a um, still quite a prevalent problem in advice? And um, do you think, what do you think practically as business owners are tuning in today can do to ensure that they're making room for women at the top? Yeah, look, I think that was a good comment that Brad made. And I think we just shouldn't say that it's also a male issue. It can be a female issue as well. We need to... We, we absolutely need to make room for people to step up and encourage them because quite often when you've got um, a business that is top heavy, um, uh, even with, with males and sometimes there's females in there, you know, what are we doing to, to one of the, what are we doing to get them up there? One of the things Cheryl Sandberg said in her book was we need sponsors. 
you know so really what we should be doing is sponsoring um, women so that's that then that can be a male sponsoring a woman to help her get through that I guess we call it the glass ceiling, but getting to that next level. Sponsors are really, really important in, in large businesses, small businesses, and just in the general community. Because what that's doing is you're mentoring somebody to be able to get to that level. Um, yes, we do need to make room. Um, you know, conversations around the boardroom, um, sometimes they're, they're top heavy with males, and how do women fit into that? Um, sometimes we make the mistakes that we try to be like males, and we shouldn't. We should encourage them to actually be themselves and get out there and say what they feel they need to say and not feel like um, they're not going to be heard. So I think in business, I think to get you know gender equality and let's say diversity as well, because it's not just about women, it's getting diverse views within a company and on a board, is that we need to figure out how we can sponsor these women through to these roles. And yes, make the gap. Um, you know, we, we talk about, you know, quotas on boards. Um, do I personally believe in quotas on boards? I, as a woman, I kind of say, well, it should be the best person for the job. But quotas, what that does is it brings the conversation alive. Yeah. You know, if we, have a, if we have gender diversity on the board, you know, quotas are, I guess, some way of leading to getting the conversation going and maybe getting encouragement from more women. Um, business owners, yeah, I think you need to think about flexible hours you know, for, for all your staff, but especially if you want to get women to step up. How can we make it easier for them to do these roles with some of the issues that they have as the nurturer in the home? Okay, awesome. Okay, that's great. Um, uh, you mentioned before there's there's only 20% of females in advice. I know Alex Vukovic, uh, this, uh, earlier this week, uh, doing a wrap-up of the event, wrote, um, not only are there um, just 20% of women in advice, but although 66% of women are the joint financial decision makers in their home, only 31% of women receive professional advice. So that's a really big um, disparity between those two numbers. Do you think that the uptake of female advisors would result in the increase of females receiving advice? Um, and along those lines, um, what do you think we can do to um, combat the problem of only 31% of females receiving advice? In, in answer to your question, do we think if uh, we get more females in advice, will we increase women taking advice? I, I, th I think we have to agree that that, that would happen. Um, yeah. A lot of women, and I see a lot of women in my business, feel sometimes a little bit intimidated by a male. And that's not saying that, you know, these male advisors are not great at what they do. It's just how they personally feel, especially if they've been through a divorce, a marriage breakup, um, or they're in that position where they've worked all their lives, they're you know, in their 50s and they don't have anything to show for it. So they come in immediately um, defending themselves and feeling bad about the fact that they haven't gotten anywhere. Um, sometimes that conversation is better had with a woman rather than a male. Um, so I do think we can um, lift females getting advice. Um, that's one of the things that we want to achieve out of Inspire as well, is getting more women to get advice. You know, 40% of women retire with less money than males, and we have to change that. And how do we do that? I know the government's trying to put some initiatives together at the moment, but, you know, some of them got through Parliament recently and some of them didn't. But we as an advice community, I think it comes back to education. Um, we recently in the AFA did a white paper on the health and well-being of advice and the differences between men and women and how they actually perceive getting advice. Women are very conservative compared to men who want to run out there and just go, yeah, you know, let's go for the most aggressive investment. So we need to we need to uh, be, be teaching all advisors how do they talk to women uh, mm -hmm. when they get advice. Um, what are women actually going to be looking for? Um, it's like it's like the car industry. They completely change their conversation in how to sell a car to a woman because women were not interested in what's under the boot. You know, is it the right colour? Has it got a coffee holder? I know, you know, these are the things that they, uh, some women like to know what's under the boot, I do. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's, that's the sort of conversation we need to be having is educating people how to deal with women and educating women as to why they need to get advice. And too often they think that it's their, they're the nurturers in the home, the family come first, they'll worry about that secondary and then it hits them later on. So it's a, it's a really good point that you make. 
Okay, okay, cool. I'm going to ask you one more question and then I'm going to hand over to Phil. And that is, um, uh, we just touched on the government stuff there. Is there um, anything in particular you think that the government um, can be doing better or that you think uh, incentives that government or legislation that should be brought through to increase the number of females giving advice um, and the number of females receiving advice? I think it's a difficult one for governments to um, to deal with women getting into advice. I think that's our that's our piece as an industry to do that. Yeah. Um, how do they get consumers, female consumers, to get advice? Um, financial literacy is something I know um, that the government is working on in ASIC, but we need to put a little bit more out there about women. Um, there's a lot of things that need to be educated to advisors on financial um, abuse to women. There's a lot of that happening at the moment, obviously through divorces and how they've been, um, you know, the provider of, of, the, of the nurturer in the family and then all of a sudden, you know, through a divorce they're tipped out and they don't have the ability to do things because that's not what happened. And, and that does exist today. I see a lot of them. But the government needs to look again at initiative generally for women to get back into the workforce. How do we deal with childcare? How do we deal with the pay gap? You know, uh, financial services, 26% different in pay. How do we deal with pay gap? Why is it there? Why does it exist? Um, and also initiatives around getting women to put money into superannuation. Um, there was a whole bunch of initiatives that we put together in a, in a paper to, to um, the government recently. Some of them were taken up, some of them weren't. And I think there's more conversation has to have around what the government can do. Um, it'd be great if childcare could be, you know, tax deductible, some of those things that, you know, could happen that would help women get back into the workforce. But also, you know, what are the initiatives the government can do to get more women putting money at least into superannuation? You know, maternity leave, um, you know, when they're off on maternity leave, can we do something there around, you know, continuing super guarantee while they're off on maternity? There's simple things that can be done that I know that are being talked about and some initiatives are coming through, but it's just slow. It's not happening quick enough, I don't think. You yeah, know, I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, totally with you on the uh, women in superannuation thing. I think there definitely needs to be something done there to at least engage women in superannuation and um, make sure that we're doing what we can to uh, secure our retirement. So that, a, that's a, a controversial one, Naomi, could be the fact that, you know, majority of small businesses these days, home businesses are run by women. Um, mm -hmm. Running a business as a sole trader, you're not required to put money into superannuation. So is yeah. that a simple answer that maybe, um, you know, we should encourage, you know, um, sole traders to be required to put some superannuation uh, away, which would then help with, you know, women, obviously, who, you know, you as, as a business owner, you'll get through all of the things you need to do. Um, but at the end of the day, the super is not top of mind. And how do we how do we do that? Um, it comes back to financial literacy and it comes to education. Um, and we've all got to do that as an industry, every single one of us. Mm. OK, awesome. OK, over to you, Phil. Awesome, Deb. This is a great topic. I just want to uh, encourage everyone watching to uh, jump in the discussion. Uh, this is can, can be seen as a loaded topic, um, and I'm really keen to uh, discuss kind of what there is to discuss about it. Even if you know there can be you know some stigma around you know some questions that you might want to be asked. You don't want to be seen as you know the sexist uh, asking these questions, but. Uh, and unless we bring it out and talk about it, even if you may not personally agree with, you know, the questions you're asking, uh, it's more important to discuss it than to kind of hide behind, you know, uh, nameless internet comments, um, you know, because that's kind of where I feel the discussion goes. It either goes all, you know, you know, gender equality, there's, you know, there's lots of issues or um, let's just be, you know, behind our own computer and, and you know, disagree with this uh, stuff. So as much as we can kind of open up the discussion, uh, I'm really keen to uh, to do that. So with that in mind, Deb, I'm uh, really keen to know, you know, what you think males, uh, what our part to play in this in this discussion is. You know, not as a, you know, I'm, I'm the knight coming down, um, helping the damsel in distress, but, you know, we've, it's a really important issue. Um, you know, gender equality, um, you know, pay gap. There's a whole bunch of issues that we've kind of touched on. What do you think we, as males in the industry, the male executives, um, what what's the best way forward, do you think? 
Look, uh, I, I think it's all about, Phil, it's all about encouragement. You know, it's all about um, encouraging women. Males um, can be great mentors for women. Some of my best mentors were men. They weren't, they weren't women. Um, and I think women can learn a lot from really great males in our industry. And I would encourage any women out there that are listening, go seek out a really good mentor. Now, whether that be a male or a female, if, you know, and sometimes males are very good because, you know, some of, some of the guys out there have built great businesses, you know, they've been able to um, become, you know, financial advisors from power planners. So how did they do it? You know, so I encourage men to really get behind women that they can see should be, you know, going through to advisor level. And as I said earlier, sponsor them, which is a form of mentoring, you know, getting getting in behind them and encouraging them and teaching them um, to, to get up to these levels. You know, I think, I think as um, business owners, what are the opportunities that we can give to women in our business? You know, identify one of your ladies that's in the back room doing your para planning. Um, is she going to be your next advisor? And how are you going to get her, give her that journey? Um, initially, the discussion may be, oh, I don't think I can be an advisor. But hey, if you've got the skill set, um, and encourage them, give them the pathway to do it. And that may include some flexibility as well, because we know a lot of women uh, do have families. So I think that's where a role that men can play is, is really, you know, start mentoring these women, um, start encouraging them. And, and do you think there's any more um, bigger community initiatives that we really should be, you know, if you were the puppet master and you could have, you know, one or two initiatives you could start right now, everyone in the industry would get behind, what do you think they would be? Um, I think ensuring that you don't have a pay gap in your, in your business, right? Um, you know, women will uh, sit through their review and they may ask for, uh, this came up in our forum the other day, mm -hmm. you know, we had an example of a male in the business asked for a $50,000 pay increase and the female asked for about ten. Right? Was 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 the female uh, at the same level as the guy? Absolutely. Um, I just think we need to make sure that in our industry we get rid of that 26% pay gap. I think that would be a really great initiative for financial services to see. Um, and what what initiatives can we do within business, high you know uh, corporate level, right down to advice businesses, small ones like mine and others. How can we make sure that that pay gap doesn't end? That that I think would be a fabulous thing for us all to do. So does that in that example does the employer offer up an extra forty grand to the female advisor or uh, knock back the the increase from the male advisor? Uh, that's for the individual business owner, but I think um, even if they knock back the guy on that high level, I think they should be encouraging the woman um, that's sitting in front of them that if their talents are there. Maybe they should be asking for more. Yeah, I mean, my, for me, my solution for that is just pay transparency. If everyone knew exactly what everyone else made, then there wouldn't be no kind of, oh, is there a pay gap, isn't there a pay gap? We'd know that this advice is earning this much and this advice is earning this much. And, and, and that's exactly right. Transparency is good. And one of the things that the, the Gender Equality Agency has just put out a paper on gender pay gap is educating women to negotiate for themselves. And this came up in Naomi's blog that she recently did, um, that women, a, a lot of women for some reason are considered not good negotiators. So if you go back to that story about the guy saying, well, I want this, probably knowing that he's not going to get it, but, you know, then he starts at a high point, comes a low, where maybe um, the, the women start at a low point, hoping they'll get to a high point. So one of the things that they said is, um, in this particular paper is women need education around what um, what what pays are out there what what uh, or, you know what salaries are out there what what should they be doing um, educating themselves on how to maybe ask for the next role or ask for that extra pay you know it comes back down to education that was a big piece that came out of that particular white paper was around you know educating women to be a bit more educated about their own circumstances as you say what other pays um, and salaries are out there but also be able to negotiate their position yeah so i mean this next question is going to be a bit more of a long-winded question um so <laughs> bear with me everyone Thank you. Um, <laughs> Podcast. If you're not listening to it, get on it. It's amazing. Um, 
but they they recounted a story about in Africa uh, farmers who had uh, no insurance were less likely to take a risk, uh, and then they had a fake insurance policy that Planet Money created. It was they were actually going to insure the farmers, but uh, they found that the farmers were more willing to take risks. So. Uh, how does that make sense? Good question. Bringing that back to, you said before that females are less likely to take a risk or take a chance. Do you think that's because, um, you know, if they take a risk and they fail, it's, it's a bigger impact on their careers or their lifestyle than as from the male counterparts? No, I don't think so. I think it's just the fear of failure. I think it's just the fear of failure that, um, you know, so, yeah, taking a leap of faith Sometimes it takes that confidence to say, look, I can do this, but you know, what the heck, if I fail, this is plan B, right? Um, I don't think a lot of women think like that. They sit back and go, what if I do this? What are the implications? The implications are too hard for me to accept, so I won't do it, right? I'll give you an example with me. Years ago, first house, we children, young children, I'd started in my own business. I went to my husband and said, we've got to sell the house. Why do you want to sell a house? Because I want to put money into the business and we'll go rent. Um, not, not a lot of people do that because their house is their house. But my view was, well, okay, I go out and rent. I put money into my business. Um, I'll build up my business and then I'll go buy something later on, which is what we did. Um, but that's the leap of faith, right? Not too many people want to sell the house to go and put it in the business. Um, not too many people will borrow against the house to put it in the business. Um, you've got to take those risks and believe in yourself that you are actually going to do what you set out to do. If you fail, there's always plan B, always plan B. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a pretty inspiring story to, uh, to have that much belief in yourself to just go sell your house and, and start the business. So uh, I, I know people take encouragement out of that. Um, my last question uh, before we go to audience questions is, um, it, on this discussion, people are either um, uh, publicly for gender equality, uh, they're either staying silent um, or they're privately or secretly vehemently against it. Um, so what do you think the best way for us as an industry or as a community, as a society, to, to discuss these issues in an open um, forum? How do we do that? Uh, well, look, forums like this are a start, aren't they? Um, you know, forums of, of having, you know, International Women's Day. Uh, I remember when that first sort of started, it was very silent. Now look at it. It's a major big day. I mean, even small businesses internally celebrate International Women's Day with the women in their office. We've got to keep the conversation going. We've got to point out where the issues are and how can we all as a community and um Australians get rid of gender equality. If we don't keep the conversation going in numbers of forums, and look, you know, everybody out there, if they feel that there are areas that the government can be doing, write to your politician, go see your local member, make sure that you, you are heard on these issues and say, look guys, you know, 47% of women retire with not enough super. How can we change it? What, what's your ideas out there as advisors? Take it to your local member. It, it is a funny subject, Phil, because sometimes people think that we're all burn our bras feminists, but it's not. This is about this is about just getting gender balance. That's all that needs to happen. And you know, women choose to stay home and have children and be mothers, and I think that's fabulous. But how can we make sure that they've got some form of wealth as well? You know, it doesn't mean that this is all about women have to ha have high level power jobs. This is about encouraging women in whatever they do, including being at home. But how can we make it easier for them to be at home? How can we make it easier for a woman to step up to a, a, a job, uh, a high level role? Um, it's all about encouragement, you know, get out there and teach them to be resilient and take leaps of faith. But we've all got to continue the conversation listen to it, contribute to it. If you think there's a way you can make a difference politically, yeah, go do it. Um, it's really just keeping the conversation going. That's really what we can do. Awesome. So I, I totally agree with what you're saying, Deb. Um, as a husband of an amazing 
uh, woman uh, who has looked after our three kids um, and is working at the moment. And I know she, from a time when she was a stay-at-home mum, uh, she just answering that question, she always felt a bit uncomfortable because, you know, she felt like, oh, people are going to judge me, but that's all I am. Um, so, yeah, just encouraging, and you know, people who are looking after their children because uh, it is uh, an amazing uh, thing to do. So we'll go to we'll go to audience questions. Uh, Ann Taylor's uh, asked, you know, how do we get involved in Inspire? It sounds amazing. You've you've spruced it heaps. How do we get involved? <laughs> uh, how you get involved? Um, there's numerous um, Inspire events around the country through the AFA. Um, obviously, the best way to be is a member because you get all of the communications through. But certainly, if you're interested, um, contact the AFA to find out who your state chair is and put your name down to go to some events because they're all fabulous events. Um, that's probably the quickest and easiest way to do it. So just a follow-on question from that, is that AFA Inspire just for females or for males as well? No, absolutely not. We actually have a lot of males come along to our events, Phil. Um, we, we, we encourage males because, you know, the reason to have males in the room is to listen to the conversation because sometimes they just don't understand. Um, what's going on. Um, we had a, an incident in South Australia where, where there was a group of males in a particular session. A woman got up and she talked about how she was treated in her business and how she lost, uh, you know, as an employee and how she lost her confidence and it's taken her years to get it back through all these different things that happened to her. What resulted out of that was a group of males standing up and saying, we are going to champion to other males not to speak like that, not to do that. Um, and if they hadn't been in the room, they wouldn't have heard that particular conversation. So yeah, very much for males. And we, we have cool people on, so you know, for, for men to listen to as well. Awesome. And, and how can you show empathy if you don't actually understand, uh, you know, what it is yeah. to walk in other people's shoes? So the next question is, um, okay, I didn't even read the next question, so bear with me. Um, do you want me to jump in? Go, Naomi, please. Sorry. So um, Jenny, Jenny's saying, um, is there an age bracket that is more accepting of gender parity or is it more about the individual, do you think? Um, an age bracket around gender parity. I think, I think the younger, the younger um, guys coming through, I think are very different to some of the older ones. And, but I also think the older ones are learning. Um, you know, I go back to my days. I mean, things that, that happened in my days were would be totally unacceptable in today's, um, you know, today's society. But it, it, is, it is what it is, you know. It, it just that I think now um, a lot of younger um, males coming through, they don't really see why there should be um, a gender disparity when it comes to pay or any of that sort of thing. I think the older generation are starting to learn because they're listening to the conversations. Some may never get it, uh, um, but I do think that the younger, because the younger guys like Phil and, and the guys on XY, they're, they're all listening to this now at a young age, you know, and saying, well, hang on, I'd like to see my daughter when she grows up be able to have an equal pay to a guy she comes out of university with and does exactly the same job. So I think that's the exciting thing that the new generations are actually helping us. Okay, the next question is from Sharon Evans. She's asking, what's your position on educating uh, like primary and high school girls about financial independence and not relying on the Prince Charming to solve their money issues? Oh, good, good one. I love this one because um, I really have a pet hate for the, for the name, a man is not a plan. Get rid of that, right? No. Um, I think that we should be in schools talking to young women to be financially, um, uh, I guess, you know, financially fit for themselves. Um, interesting you say that because in Inspire where we, we might, we're look, working at the moment on potentially having a schoolgirl program where we go out and um, our advisors from around the country can be encouraged to go out and speak to young women. Um, I particularly like this one because as I said, I came from the suburb of Hard Knocks, bullied badly, um, left school early. I like to get out there and talk to these women and say, this is what I've done. You don't have to be a product of that. But in doing that, also get them encouraged to be, you know, look after their own financial futures. Um, because I think this is the key for women, is what we need to make sure that they don't just see that getting married, um, 
that it's all passed over to the other person, the, the, the male, you know, that they need to be financially secure. One of the things I wanted to do when I um, started my business, and it was a little thing that I don't know why, I just wanted to earn more than my husband. <laughs> and I think um, it was just my thing. He knew. We used to laugh about it. Um, uh, but, you know, I think absolutely we need to have um, financial education programs to go out in schools to educate all children, but in particular if we want to educate women to really, um, you, know, you know, see what they can do, you know, encourage them to be champions because they can. Be the best that they can be. I love that. That's awesome. <laughs> Earn more than my husband. I love it. Um, next question is um, from Cassie. Hi, Cassie. Um, I know Cassie. Uh, how can we encourage people to return to the workforce after a gap in employment, uh, mainly due to maternity leave? Uh, she said, I know I found it hard even to get an interview after an eight month break. Um, is there a scheme to bring skills up to date, uh, for example? Um, look, that, that's an interesting question. I don't know if there's anything that actually, you know, that, that were skills updates, but I think that's a really good point. Um, getting women upskilled after they've been out of work for a long time. And maternity leave is one thing, but think about the older women who maybe have to go back to work after a broken marriage, you know, so there needs to be initiatives around that um, to get women back into the workforce. Um, I think, you know, I think it's an interesting one because as an employer, um, how do we make the room for a woman to come back? Because what I see a lot, and the interesting thing is my husband works in cosmetics, so he sees this a lot, where women, um, they go up the ladder um, and then and get to really top level marketing roles and GM roles and they leave, they come back after having children and they can't do it because the, the role is too much to balance the family. So. How can employers, I think this is a better question, cater for women when they come back after maternity leave with maybe part-time solutions, working from home solutions? You know, I know there's some businesses out there that do it um, even in financial services really well. So some of the big corporations are really doing this well, having childcare on site, a few things like that. But um, I sympathise because I hear that story a lot, that it's really hard to go back into the workforce after you've, um, but there's some of the, the thoughts that I would have. Okay, okay. great. So the next question is from Benny Nash. Um, he's on the other side of the camera. He's asking questions, not interviewing, which is good. Um, do you think it's just advisors generally weren't great at soft skills? So, sorry, I'll backtrack. Referring to the comment before about soft skills and the women are better at this, uh, do you think that it's uh, just that advisors generally weren't great at soft skills and now we're getting better at this as an industry. Are we getting better at soft skills? Yeah, we are. We are because, um, you know, if I go back to years ago in advice, um, advice was considered people would sit in front of you and the first thing that was asked was, um, why are you here? Um, let's, let's go through all of your financials and let's come up with a solution, okay? Um, there wasn't a lot of talk around you know, what do you want to achieve? What's your financial goals? What does your life look like in five and 10 years time? There was some of that conversation, but I think a lot of it was more, uh, you know, just looking at the financials. I would actually say to, to Ben, I think there are some really great men out there that do, do have some fabulous soft skills. So let's not just pigeonhole them as not. Um, I think traditionally they came from a sense of solution mode. Um, I do think women have a really good sense of empathy because it's just inherent as who we are. You know, when, when we meet somebody, you know, people like to engage with people who are like them, people who understand them um, and sympathise with their situations. So if a woman comes in, for instance, and, and I've had these examples where um, lived a high life, hasn't got anything to show for it, late 50s, buys a lot of shoes, um, goes out for dinner a lot. It's having that conversation. Women are good at having that conversation and saying, you know, it's great to do all of those things um, because I probably do some of them myself, but this is what we need to do to get you financially secure. Um, I think as an industry, we are getting better at it because we're talking about it more, we're educating ourselves more, and we've changed the conversation away from solution mode to back to what is it that the client really, really needs and wants. Life plans, yeah. 
yeah, I, I've had to work really hard on, on my soft skills because I uh, struggle with empathy. Um, my wife will tell you that. Um, so Ben's also asked, uh, where do women go for really good mentoring? Sorry, what was that one? Where do women go for good mentoring? Uh, when, where to? Yeah, where do we where do we find them? Oh, yeah. Look, um, mentoring is interesting because, like, the AFA has a mentoring program which you can jump into. Um, but in my view, I think you need to seek out somebody. This is what I would do and what I've done in the past. Seek out somebody that you feel. Um, is somebody that you aspire to, you know, you're, you're watching what they're doing. Um, you think, well, this, this person, whether it be a male or a female, is really doing such a great job that I would like to do. Go ask them. Go and ask them whether they will mentor you. Um, and I know that sometimes it's hard because people get very busy and it's hard to mentor. But, you know, even if it's just conversations over a cup of coffee, um, I, I firmly believe in looking to people who you would aspire to and tapping them on the shoulder. I really do. But is, there is a formal mentoring program through the AFA if people want to join it. Um, but, you know, I think as women and especially women leaders, um, and I consider myself in that position. I've got the title of Woman of the Year. That comes responsibility, you know, that I'm, I'm out there to encourage and help women. Um, that's my responsibility. And I think a lot of uh, women think that they can't tap women on the shoulder because they're in these high level positions, but I would encourage you to do that. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, and I, I, my, my philosophy is uh, just pick up the phone, don't, be afraid to look stupid so i've never been afraid to look stupid before so um just ask as ben said ask and you'll receive he's never been knocked back yet from mentoring we're, we're yeah. very um as a community we're very um open and we're very sharing and especially within the afa network we seem to have that ability um i did it years ago you know i went fee for advice back in 1996 I saw a guy that was doing it really well, picked up the phone, knocked on the door, bought him a cup of coffee and a bit of lunch and learned a lot. And on that note, I think I, I might chime in here and just say a big uh, public thank you to Deb uh, for joining us, but also for being an unofficial um, mentor and woman uh, that I admire in the industry. Um, and it's, it's such a... Um, awesome thing to have someone out there to look up to and you are definitely one of those women for me so thank you very much for putting your money where your mouth is when it comes to mentoring <laughs> and inspiring other women so thank you all right thank you everyone for watching it's been a fantastic session and let's just keep the discussion going on the xy facebook group uh it's pumping i don't know almost 250 people in there uh questions being asked and answered every single day um, so make sure you join there. We'll continue the discussion on this hot topic. I'm sure people have got uh, many differing views and, and that's exactly what we want. We just want to keep the discussion going, as Deb said. And uh, just echoing what Naomi said, uh, Deb, you are an inspiration and we just thank you so much for coming on and sharing with us all your experiences. And guys, make sure if you're in Sydney on the 30th of May, March, not May, or you can go on the 30th of May, but 30th of March, we've got our XY social event. I'm flying up, got an email from Cassie saying she's flying up for it. So there's two Melbourneites there, so it's going to go off. Um, so make sure you attend. Uh, there's a link uh, in the chat right now. So click on it, register. It'll cost you all of $42, but it'll be the best. $42 you'll spend this year. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Thanks Naomi, you did a ripper job. Uh, Thanks, and thank you very much, Deb. Thanks. Thank you. All right, see you everyone. Have a good week. See you later, everybody.